you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. I'm happy to be with you. Thanks exactly. for inviting me. That's incredible on May Day um, in an unprecedented moment in our world's history that we get to have an opportunity to reflect on you know, the organizing and the fighting that's, that's happening today um, and that's happening among our NLLI community. So welcome to those of you who are with us now and to those who will see this video later to our second Facebook Live for the National Labor Leadership Initiative. I'm Jennifer Boitin. I'm from the NLLI season four and um, I'm really grateful to be here to talk to my sister. You can introduce yourself, Ada. Hi, my name is Ada Briseño, and I'm from NNLI Season 5, recommended by Jennifer, and I'm very thankful for that recommendation, and um, I'm also co-president of Unite Here Local 11, the Hotel Workers Union in Los Angeles, Orange County, and Arizona. And I'm going to brag a little bit about Ada because she is very humble. In addition to that, she is the chairwoman of the Orange County Democratic Party, the spearhead of the organization when Orange County turned blue, and she's part of the infrastructure that's fighting not only to keep it blue, but to keep it blue with workers front and center. It's a really beautiful, incredible thing. And it's why uh, today on May Day to be able to talk to you about the organizing you're doing throughout the community here is, is just so important. And you know, I also know that when the COVID crisis began, your that really hit home, and your son contracted the the virus. So I really just first want to check in and see how you're doing, and how your son's doing, how your family's doing. Well, my son is doing well now. Uh, he had some hard moments, uh, not as obviously difficult as many uh, other Americans uh, that have perished. Um, but definitely it was uh, very difficult. It was very difficult to keep, make sure that my husband stayed safe. Um, and um, he had about nine tough days. Um, and I can tell you that we're still grieving. It's, it's, it's a really odd experience. Um, you know, he had 102.8 fever, uh, despite, you know, having just taken Tylenol, you know, day after day. Uh, he couldn't eat for four days. He hardly drank anything uh, for a few days. He hallucinated, for God's sake. It, it was just um, grueling, the chills, you name it. Um, so we had some hard moments, uh, really, but I, I'm very thankful to be on this side and say that he's well now. Uh, he's fully recovered, and uh, we're trying to stay safe. Thank God that I didn't have anything huge I was just um, I was just hoping that I wouldn't come down with it before my son started healing. So I'm glad to have had the opportunity to care for him while he was going through through that situation. And you know, just sending prayers and thoughts to everybody out there to stay uh, stay home and stay safe and and uh, to care for their health first and foremost. And and thankful also to all our you know essential workers for being out there and putting their lives at risk. Um, every single day for you and, and, and myself. Uh, I, I couldn't be more grateful to them um, after going through this situation. And uh, you, have, you and I talked a little bit before we, we got on here, but what you described, you know, coming back uh, to work after having cared for him, you know, you, you walked back into your union in the middle of crisis. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, 32,000 workers, you know, at the height of our union, right before the pandemic, we represent, you know, housekeepers and dishwashers and cooks and whole bunch of victories. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, the pandemic hits and, um, and I watching our union, like, literally fall apart right in front of our eyes. Um, out of the 32,000 members, we were lucky to have, you know, 500 people working. And so we started negotiating and making sure healthcare was taken care of and weeks of pay for some, for, for some of our workers and so forth. But then we realized that, you know, the difficulty of, of we were not going to be able to meet, you know, staff uh, payroll. And so we had no choice but to make sure that we put a, a, a um, something into place that would allow us to make sure that at the end of this pandemic that we saw this through, that we protected the union, that we did this 
work with our fiduciary responsibility and moving forward. So I, I left right in the middle of crafting that plan about how we were going to move our union forward. My team, the union was amazing in, in the time that I was gone to care for my kid. And um, when I came back, you know, um, we had no choice but to lay off 51 out of our 110 staff people. And so I feel like that sort of hit me all at the same time, the people that I've worked with and, and that have become my family uh, throughout the 29 years of, of, of my uh, leadership in the union. And it was just really difficult, still grieving my son coming into this situation of laying off. I never thought that I would live a moment in my, in my leadership that I had to go through this. Um, you know, the necessity is, is there more now than it was before the pandemic. We have, you know, many of our members are, and people in our industry, whether unionized or not, are one paycheck away from homelessness. And that's why we fight, fight so hard, right, um, to, uh, to move them forward. And here we are where they don't have a paycheck anymore. So we've turned around and we've just decided to fight harder than ever. We're working harder than ever, despite the reduction of our staff. Um, you know, we've been able to reach out to 25,000 of our, uh, you know, phone calls, 25,000 members to tell them what's out there and available and what we're working up to just ease the little pain that they're in. In, in addition to worrying about their finances and their health and their livelihood, you know, um, we've been able to talk to them about the uh, food banks that we're setting up for thousands of people um, every single week. We've been able to um, fill out uh, thousands of applications, unemployment applications. We've trained 150 uh, students to help us fill out those applications for our members because some of them don't know the language or have the ability to go online to do that. So, you know, we've been doing what we could to make sure that, uh, that we're alleviating uh, the difficulty. And we're ensuring them that once the pandemic is over, that they will return to their jobs with their seniority. We were also able to set up hardship funds, not only here in California, but Arizona, for those folks that are unable to get unemployment insurance. Um, and, you know, we want to share that link with you at some point. But, uh, you know, one of the fascinating things that I feel most proud about is that in those 25,000 phone calls, we also spoke to our members about lobbying, you know, their congressional delegation, lobbying city council. And, you know, um, I feel so proud to say that two days ago, uh, Mayor Garcetti in the city of Los Angeles just passed, uh, you know, historic recall and retention policy not only for union workers, but non-union hotels across all of Los Angeles to make sure that they're valuing the work of those dishwashers, cooks, and bellmen. Without them, there would be no industry. There would be no tourism industry. And so we've got to honor their decades of work in those hotels and make sure, ensure that they come back um, to work there and be able to continue to provide for their families. Or we had them lobby uh, the, uh, LAX, so the companies that uh, were asking uh, for rent relief from, the, uh, from LAX. We said no rent relief unless you're able to provide health care uh, for our members. And so we got two months for 4,000 people of additional health care in return, they will make, make sure that they're, they get rent relief. So, you know, we've been working really hard to make sure that our people are, are taken care of uh, in any way that we can. And I feel proud that they've been right in the middle of that, pushing hard uh, to, to, to move forward. And they have, I mean, all of your workers have been front and center in this fight. In fact, today in the LA Times uh, story just came out talking about how this moment, in the moment of this crisis, unions are organizing. And there's this incredible image of one of your members standing in the middle of the street fighting. Um, it's so powerful. I think you've done such an incredible job. Your union has done such an incredible job of getting the stories of your members out there, both through um, earned media and also through some videos that you're doing, which we can link to in the comments. But is there a story of a worker that's really stuck with you um, throughout this moment that, that you want to share with the group? Well, um, 
So I can share uh, uh, many stories, but the story of Maria, uh, who uh, ha who's a room attendant, and um, she lives with her husband or, or, or boyfriend and um, mother, niece, and cousin, all in the same house. And they have all gotten COVID-19. Yeah. So they have had no choice but to take care of each other in a crisis situation. She wasn't working. Her husband was working, um, you know, in, in, uh, as an essential worker. That's how he brought the, the COVID-19 back um, to, the, to the house. But prior to that, she was making sure that she was giving food to, um, to workers prior to her getting sick. So what a difficult situation uh, to be in, to have almost everybody, except for one of her daughters didn't get it. So she was taking care of everyone. And it was, you know, how does she get up uh, while she's in, in the middle of this COVID-19 uh, to care for her mom? You yeah. know, it's, it's just been devastating how homes have been hit. Uh, you know, uh, especially when you have many people in a very tight um, area. It's been very, very difficult uh, for our membership. Yeah, I mean, I, it's hard to imagine how just you as a leader going day to day are managing these short term, you know, these short term fires with the long term planning that, you know, you're executing at a policy wide level and really having a vision for working people and a vision for how workers you know, can and should and will have a seat at the table as we emerge from this crisis. I wonder if there's anything that you can talk about that you're really drawing from now from your experience through the National Labor Leadership Initiative that's helping you navigate this. Well, you know, I think um, you know, definitely there's a lot of lessons uh, that, we, uh, that you and I went through uh, you know, in those sessions and collaborating with, you know, everybody else's experience. But, you know, the fact that, you know, um, are you going to be on the right side of history when things happen? You know, are you going to be courageous enough? I remember those, those words coming from our lessons, you know. Uh, I remember when uh, we brought up the civil rights movement where, you know, um, AFSCME was the union that really stood up for, in that movement. And so what kind of a movement are we going to have? And we were pushed to think about our involvement uh, in, in, in moments um, of tribulations and how far we were going to push. But also to know that, you know, maybe everything we're doing now won't work, but if we don't try anything, then nothing will work. And so being courageous and being unafraid uh, to, to lose or, you know, not to have the perfect plan but really being persistent. I remember, you know, that, uh, you know, that I learned at, at NLLI that transformations, you know, are very difficult because it's a long-term process, you mm -hmm. know, and it requires, um, you know, tenacity and strength uh, to draw upon um, and that it's, it's not easy. And that's why sometimes it doesn't happen. Um, but um, I'm, I'm thankful at the local that there's so many tenacious leaders uh, that are willing to try and get, you know, reinvent ourselves. And that's another thing that transformation requires, you know, us to be thinking about, you know, we may have had a perfect plan, you know, uh, in February and things were moving forward where we were picking up a lot of members to make sure that they had a voice in, in our system. But, you know, now those are not going to work anymore. And we've got to get innovative and thoughtful and be open-minded and all those things I acquired and I learned, you know, at NLLI. Well, you're such an inspiration, Ada, and a wonderful leader. We're so grateful to have you. Is there anything else you wanted to share with the group before we end our conversation today? No, that I think that, you know, as the labor movement, the social justice movement, we're a family, no matter where we are in our nation, and that we should, you know, understand that it's our, you know, how, no matter how small our contribution, it's all going to make sure that we help people that are in the fringes. All our issues are coming out in our country. We're seeing that we're leaving people behind and, and that our systems, the, the system that we have in place is leaving undocumented folks behind, people without insurance behind. And this is our moment. We've got to step up right now and lead 
just like in, after the Great Depression, is when our movement rose even more. So I would like to partner up with folks across the labor movement, across our great country, and say, we're going to take this country back. So Amen. that's what I'd like to say. Amen, sister. Uh, it's so good talking to you. Ada mentioned the relief fund for Unite Here Local 11 workers, and uh, Kathleen and others from the National Labor Leadership Institute have al have already um, set up a spot on the NLLI Facebook page where people can post their relief funds. We'd love to be able to share those. And Ada also is cool with us sharing this video uh, to your networks if you think it would be helpful. So thank you again. We look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.